Uh, I am uh, an advisor to the Minister of National Education. I was here last week for the graduation ceremony, or the post-graduation ceremony. Um, and I've been researching about artificial intelligence, uh, and AI in the title stands for artificial intelligence. I've been researching artificial intelligence for the past 15 years. But as I've been researching and thinking about artificial intelligence, I have kind of discovered a few missing links that we should think in this country, especially in this country. I wrote three pieces over the past two years. One is Gestellschaft. Gestell is a term, is a Heideggerian term, which um, defines the ways in which technology inframes you. So you are trapped by technology, and that's back in the 50s. And I kind of came up with the idea, like Gesellschaft and Gemenschaft, a new kind of form of society, which technology is a very strong denominator, which is Gestellschaft, and you can read it. Then I wrote Another piece for, and these both these pieces were uh, published in in Nihayet Dergisi. Yapay Zika Evrensel Beyannamesi Mümkün Mü? Is a universal declaration of artificial intelligence possible? And there I kind of uh, investigated whether or not a universal ethical code is possible as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. And before these two pieces, I wrote, I'd written another piece, and that's one of the, the missing, list, missing links that I referred shortly ago. Uh, the missing link in which we overlook the, 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 um, the role and the significance of the metaphysical, philosophical aspects of artificial intelligence. And these, and here in you know, this university, Turkey, the region is the place, is the place where we should be focusing on this, on this missing link, the metaphysical and the philosophical aspects of artificial intelligence. And I tried to make some links between Ibn Arabi and his famous concept of Kibrit Ahmed, the red sulfur. For those who are familiar, I'm sure there are many people here, here who are more familiar than I am to this, to this concept, and the ways in which the Gestellschaft is formed. So this is my research agenda, and I'm trying to write a book, and I'll present you very quickly, probably this is going to be the quickest um, presentation of the day. So we, we've been quite used to seeing these images, like robots, and people are talking about many experts that artificial intelligence will help scientists to hack our brains. And artificial intelligence is also in, in medicine. It can diagnose a disease or any pathological disorder more accurately than a medical doctor who went to school for six or seven whatever years. An AI can become a master chess player in under four hours. It can also sort out a, Rub a Rubik's cube under 0 0.4 seconds. Chinese schools use artificial intelligence for what we call yoklama, but that's not the only thing. Uh, because then this da data collected from students are also linked with the, the, the security, uh, the police data and health data, so they, they can, they can um, kind of um, build an interchangeable system where they can uh, make, more, uh, make better education policies. So we, we see these fake new uh, videos as well, and I, NII can produce a fake video where Obama dances on, on the streets. And this is how AI, an AI learns to wear his or her t-shirt. And this is 
the way in which an AI dreams. This is the dream of Google's DeepMind, one of the most developed AI platforms existing today in the world, after maybe IBM's Watson and Amazon's. Um, DeepMind is, is a strong uh, commercial um, platform, and this is how an AI dreams, actually. So, you can pre pretty much do everything. <clears throat> and this is um, a real person, who is Chinese and who can only speak Chinese, but the Chinese television said, okay, we need someone who looks like this person but should speak English. So the AI comes into play and they have another um, kind of um, speaker who is, or presenter, who is the same person but can speak, of course, with the help of AI, English, while presenting news like this. And this is <clears throat> the virtual assistant, Google's virtual assistant, which can speak like any person autonomously um, and can order a table at a restaurant quite humanly, in a way, um, by responding questions asked by the, uh, the person, the assistant, shop assistant, or... or, or uh, the owner in the restaurant. This is the famous SenseTime, one of the world's most valuable AI startups in the world, which um, is quite developed in a way, and which now scores Chinese citizens from zero to, to 100. So it's kind of a um, surveillance system, a very, very developed surveillance system, uh, which is piloted now in, in, in China. And as you can see, it can detect any object or any human and recognize who she, he, or it is. And if you, say, um, drive through the red, um, red light, then you are fined through this social score, what they call. And this is the robot. This is, the, again, the, the Boston Dynamic robot, which can do some miraculous things for a robot. It can jump, it can look at the control system. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but I teach at Yildiz Technical University, and I listen what control engineering means for my students, and this is pretty miraculous in a way. The control system here is quite developed. This is the Seabird, US Navy's fully autonomous warship, they call it drone ship. So it's also in the defense industry. AI is also in the defense industry. And this is one of the um, existing realities which is all around us. Autonomous vehicles, autonomous cars. Uh, you can see many now. Maybe not in Turkey, but if you go to US or Europe, you can see at least third uh, grade or third level autonomous vehicles in traffic. So the question, one of the, um, one of the events that I attended, the presenter uh, asked the very question, will AI save us or enslave us? Okay. And his, or that was her, her answer was, the choice is ours. But to, to go back to the, um, to go back to the, the beginning of the story, and we'll, I'll try to, find a couple of answers for this, very, uh, for this very question that I showed in the previous um, slide. The beginning of, um, of the story of AI can be traced back to maybe a long time ago, but the real rupture point, the real um, genesis of AI is commonly referred to um, Alan Turing's, I don't know if you are familiar with this name, um, article published in a quarterly review of psychology and philosophy, not engineering, mathematics, or logics even. A quarterly review of psychology and philosophy in October 1950. An imitation game is one of the subtitles, is his first subtitle, which is also the, the title of the film, maybe you, you watched it, which was around 
maybe 10 years ago. And the, the, the very first sentence that he, that he starts with his, his, his article was as follows. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And then you can see the, uh, the seven big names who attended or who organized the, the, the famous Dartmouth Conference in 1956 in the US. And these names include people like Claude Shannon, Marvin Minsky, McCarthy. And then they started publishing about artificial intelligence. But this, their starting point was not, again, engineering. It's not like today, which is predominantly the discussion of AI, especially in this country, is predominantly around the entrepreneurial ecosystem or the engineering faculties of some big universities. But the very question, the crux of the problem, didn't start with this. The founding fathers of artificial intelligence, the people that I mentioned, Marvin Minsky, Claude Chen, and others, Alan Turing, even Alan Turing, started the question in a very psychological and philosophical and maybe a metaphysical uh, way. Marvin Minsky wrote The Emotion Mach uh, Machine. Neil N N Nielsen, who passed away um, a couple of months ago, a quite famous name, wrote The Philosophy of AI with, in his book, Understanding Beliefs. I, again, Marvin Minsky wrote the competition, The Finite and Infinite Machines. The title can sound a bit um, like mathematical or mechanical, but it's not, believe me. And John McCarthy, again, one of the names who was in Dartmouth Conference, wrote quite recently, some 15 or 13 years ago, I can't um, see the, um, the, the, the year exactly from here, but he published The Philosophy of AI and the AI of Philosophy. So this is, these are the burning questions that I'm trying to deal with in my research agenda. And if you see that the following uh, or concurrently happening events taking place at that time on some similar subjects like artificial intelligence, thinking machines. The name, the title, Ratio Club should also be mentioned. It's a club formed by only postgrad students in the University of London. And they organized some 38 conferences from, from 1949 to, to mid-50s, I think. And Alan Turing gave a lecture here, many other names. And if you go and check, check the list of lectures, you'll see that the whole discussion started with some metaphysical, philosophical questions. And then, if you can remember um, these three names, Joshua Bingua, um, Jan Lecun, and Jeff Hinton, they were awarded the Turing Awards, uh, again, a couple of months ago. But now, if you go, for instance, to Jan Lecun's lecture, one of his lectures, and I'm a big follower of his, although I'm not an engineer myself, I follow his New York University um, lectures um, online. One of his lectures was about how machines could learn like animals and humans. And what you see is like all about symbols, okay? You see symbols, symbols, how humans and animals model the neural network of humans is the question now. That's what, is, what, what the experts call machine or deep learning in today's world. If you can see the brain, the neur neurons, and how they communicate with, it, with each other, how people think through these neural networks, etc. And the books, of course. Um, some must readings, um, uh, actually, especially Pedro Domingo's Master Algorithm. And I, benefited from that book while I was thinking about the digital Kibriti Ahmer, the digital red sulfur, how Ibn Arabi's search for the very person who is Kibriti Ahmer is like the Western enterprise looking for a master algorithm who knows everything, is my research agenda today, and how I can link these two things. My um, my burning question can be summarized with the qu 
question of finding and tracing metaphysical and philosophical aspects of artificial intelligence. And the title, that in the title, you'll see the, metaphys the latest metaphysical race. I divide metaphysical race, metaphysical race, into three. One is the singularity, the, the products of singularity, what Ray Kurzweil says, singularity, the combination of the machines and human. The combination of the, the, the digital, the cyber, the biological, and the physical. This is one. The second enterprise, which is probably, again, one of the, um, the, the, the which is seen or conceived as one of the, uh, the consequences of singularity, is another metaphysical race, which is purely machine, but who can act, think, behave like humans or animals. Okay? But I think the third metaphysical, the latest metaphysical race is the most important one, which is not about the, the race like humans or others, but it refers to a competition. And um, it's a com competition for or between the hegemonic Western or Occidental accounts of philosophy and metaphysics, which also have a great impact on artificial intelligence and the future of humanity and humankind. On the one hand, and on the other hand, the metaphysical, the metaphysics of us, which we forgot, which we don't handle, don't think. We think we do it, but we don't because we, we lost our contact and touch with truth. In the universities, engineers work with engineers only. The theologians work with theologians only. The literature people, the humanities, the social sciences, is quite Humboldtian. We need more transdisciplinary, we need more interdisciplinary work to wake up. Otherwise, it's going to be hard for us. So this metaphysical thought, to realize this metaphysical race and to do something about it, we have to emancipate from our disciplinary and scholarly prejudgments. And that's my very sharp conclusion for today. Thank you very much.